we talked with Scott quite a bit in the years leading up to this uh, big project on a major glacier in Antarctica about incorporating an EPS system onto an automated station. Um, it's a bit like an automatic weather station, but there's several additional instruments. And we decided to actually attempt to incorporate a DTS system that's completely remote, totally automated, and it sends a portion of the data, a subsampled part of the data back uh, over Iridium using a satellite phone system. Um, <clears throat> Why did we want to go to Antarctica? Well, there are big changes there in the ice sheet. And in particular, you can see my cursor. This area here is losing elevation and therefore losing mass very quickly and um, uh, uh, thinning quite a bit. And it's responding to warmer ocean conditions right in front of the uh, uh, floating ice that comes off of Antarctica. The area is called Thwaites Glacier. Um, you can see in this sort of perspective view that it's got a kind of a keystone position for this much larger area called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is the part of the ice sheet in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and it lays over some very deep terrain, terrain that's actually well below sea level. And so once this glacier begins to retreat, it's likely to accelerate and get even to a runaway situation where it will unload a lot of ice from the center of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and, um, and contribute significantly to sea level rise and probably drag quite a bit of the rest of this ice sheet with it over the course of the next few centuries. I don't have to move out of Miami just this year, but maybe a few years from now. We decided to put these uh, two of these sensors right on this little bit of floating ice right here in front of Thwaites Glacier. And this is another quick view just to give you the geometry of what we're talking about. Uh, basically, we set the stations on this ice shelf portion because we're interested in the circulation of especially warm water near the base that's melting the base of the ice as it flows off of the continent and out over the ocean. Um, so here's what the system looks like installed. We installed two of these last January um, on Thwaites ice shelf, the floating part in front of the glacier. And there's a whole lot of instrumentation on it. You can see over in this right hand uh, plot, but the main parts to look at are this um, yellow rectangle. Basically, that's indicating the DTS cable that we've put through the ice and into the ocean. So this is an ocean section here. This is ice here in the middle. And then the tower is sitting up in the air. So that's the snow surface. We bury quite a bit of the cable. We were prepared to have up to um, 1,600 meters of ocean measurement, but the ocean was about 800 meters where we installed this thing. So quite a bit of it is coiled underneath the battery. Actually, it's above the battery box in detail, but basically as a reference uh, temperature measurement that helps us calibrate this. And then the other calibration comes from, um, there's actually, yes, there are three pairs, but one of them, as you'll see, unfortunately, we didn't set it quite far enough down on the cable and it's up in the base of the ice just near the bottom. But that's what the tower looks like when it's set up. Now this rather complicated picture here, we're gonna uh, just take a quick walk. That's of course the tower picture that I just showed you. This is what the top of the borehole looks like. And there's a, a strength cable that is hanging off of this that's holding the ocean sensors, which are these steel cylinders with instrumentation in them and the DTS cable and also some thermistors uh, down this borehole. Um, this is what it takes to stand one of these things up in the field, this was used to help uh, uh, leverage this tall tower up. It's tall because there's so much snowfall that the station will get buried after a few years. So we want to have it survive as long as possible. In particular, keep the solar panels up out of the snow as long as possible. Um, it operates on uh, six of these 100 amp hour solar recharge batteries. That's our thermistor system here, but mostly I was showing you that we operate on power that's been stored from the solar panels over the winter period. And darkness in this area starts um, in late May and the sun comes up around August 20th. Uh, so we did make it through, but we had to do some things in order to get it all the way through. That's that coil of cable I showed you before down in a pit and just underneath that stomped on snow is this black box up here with the batteries in it. Um, and this is sort of the uh, center of uh, 
where most of the electronics are. There's a computer chip in there that's operating everything and quite a bit of the communication instrument, uh, uh, quite of the communication control system inside this white box, which is way up here at the top. You can see some of these other sensors. That's the Silixa unit that we put into this black unit down here that's uh, making the measurements through the cable. So the Amigos gets weather data. I'm just showing you real quickly. Uh, this is a wind rose here in this case on the right side. Uh, the winds are almost always coming off the ice sheet just because of the way weather works in this area. Um, we do have a camera on board. It's a little bit intermittent because of cold weather, but we get some nice images every once in a while of the station and of the horizon. This is really handy for revisiting the station because the pilots can see through the iridium uplink what the sky conditions are like and how well you can see the snow surface before, before landing. So now DTS data. Um, up in here is data from this spool that's stuck in the snow. And you can see there's a little bit of a gradient in these early measurements um, as that spool is sort of spinning around from one side of the snow to the other, there's a tiny temperature difference. Um, and then you're into the ice. This spike right here has to do with a cavity that we made up. I should add that the hole was uh, drilled by hot water. So we have a, a, a pump and a heating system and a, a, a jet that generates a jet of hot water down a hose. And we drive that down uh, 300 meters through the ice to create the borehole. So of course that does have a temperature influence on the ice. And you can see in these first few weeks after we installed it, that the borehole is cooling and refreezing to get to its ambient temperature, which is in the center of the ice sheet, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 20 degrees centigrade below zero. Then as you get close to the uh, ocean below, you see this rapid warming. The ocean, in the, excuse me, the ice in this area is actually being eroded by the ocean. That's part of the reason for this steep gradient. And then you're into the ocean and down to almost 800 meters, um, uh, yeah, 800 meters on a cable and 755 meters below the uh, below sea level through the bottom. And you can see some of these temperature variations in the ocean layers uh, at depth. We installed two of these systems. You're seeing another one on the right hand panel where there's been more erosion by warm ocean water. So now we're gonna take a close up of the bottom of the ice and the top of the ocean. And I'll show you that we um, had kind of an issue in terms of drilling it. When we drilled through, we create a fairly large hole with the hot water drill as we get close to the ocean because the ice is very warm. So the hot water um, <clears throat> has a bigger effect in the lower part of the hole. When we pull the hose out, we actually draw up some ocean water into the hole as we spool the hose back in before lowering instruments. And that gave us an indication that the bottom of the ice was higher up inside the ice sheet than it actually was. And so what you can see is in the weeks following installation, in fact, we were about five meters above the base of the ice and all that froze in as this water that had been drawn in um, uh, froze. So these two gray bars are marking my uh, estimated location for a seabird sensor and an aquedop sensor that unfortunately are up inside the ice. We're hoping that the ocean water will eventually uh, melt through this and expose those. That'll actually be very interesting to see what the ocean looks like immediately below the ice and then as it melts further, um, what the conditions are like a few meters below the ice. Both of them went through the same error. I've got one minute, okay. Here's the detail of the ocean uh, profiles here. And what you see is just variations in the ocean over time. There's still some calibration work to do um, here, but uh, basically the seabird gives us an independent measure of temperature down here in what's called the circumpolar deep water, a fairly warm layer that's actually doing most of the dirty work, melting away the bottom of the Antarctic ice sheet. And then this mixing zone here, we have another seabird and aquedot pair about halfway up. We position them a little differently in the second one. It's a little bit further up near the base of the water, but not all that close to the base of the ice. Still, there's something going on in here uh, in terms of the mixing layer uh, with the circumpolar deep water. And then here near the bottom again to um, look at the CDW. So as I said, we have 
traditional ocean instruments down there as well. You can see some of the temperature variations in this circumpolar deep water layer from the two sensors. We don't see a whole lot of current underneath there. And so uh, I think um, it's going to take a little bit more evaluation to see exactly where the water is coming from or flowing to. But it is circulating underneath the ice shelf um, and melting the underside a little bit closer towards the coast, if you will, um, the edge where the ice lifts off the seabed. So thanks very much. Um, that's a part of our camp. And we had lots of support on this from NSF and from the British Environmental Research uh, Program. It's a joint British and US um, uh, effort to study Thwaites Glacier um, and uh, take any questions, I guess, at the break. Thanks very much.